Suzanne Allen reporting. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the legal implications of today's report is Dr Nick McCarroll from Glasgow Caledonian University and health journalist Penny Taylor is here to talk about the medical issues raised. Welcome to you both. Can I start mm -hmm. first, Nick, with the, the legal position? The Crown Office has always said there wasn't enough evidence to prosecute Harry Clark. They say that today's report doesn't undermine that view. What, what do you think? Well, the Crown's position has been uh, more or less the same. What they've said initially was there was no criminal mind on Harry Clark when he committed, when the offence happened, well, not when the incident happened, because he was unconscious. Then, when more was revealed in terms of the, the paperwork and the lack of detail given, they've said that there wasn't enough there to express a criminal act. Indeed, the Crown have issued a statement today saying their position has been justified by the report because they said that no doctor uh, said to Harry Clark that he wasn't fit to drive and that in the, the circumstances they, they would uh, have... Uh, they wouldn't have uh, known that he was in a position that such an incident could have happened. So Harry Clark himself was not of a mind of saying he was so reckless that when he entered the, 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 the truck that he knew that he could have an incident at the wheel and therefore put people at risk. The last incident he had was in 2010. So their justification is the incidents relate to um, telling um, untruths on forms which they've made the decision of that they weren't going to prosecute in a criminal uh, way. And can you understand that decision? I think the decision has probably been made partially because of the speed that the decision was made not to prosecute Mr Clark, because such a prosecution on the issue of fraud, which essentially is what it is, telling a lie, it might shock us in some instances, telling a lie in and of itself isn't a crime. It can be in very specific circumstances, it can be obviously in court. Perjury is a very serious criminal offence uh, which is prosecuted in the High Court in Scotland when it takes place. However, if you tell a lie in a form, that is a fraud. Frauds happen all the time. It's very difficult to establish a criminal action behind that, which I think is why they've shied away from it. Rather than pursuing that to great detail, they've said that these things have happened. That the incident was a long time ago that he blacked out with that and the, and the, the accident. Therefore, I don't think they thought that that element of the, the, the action was worthy of criminal investigation. And the families are saying, though, that the, the findings today actually support their case about the, the repeated in, lying and they want to take a indeed. private prosecution. Is that likely to succeed? Well, that's a very difficult uh, process to undergo. You have to get a bill of criminal letters from the High Court to, to succeed in a private prosecution. Only twice in the last century has that happened. Actually, another in interesting point about it is it has to be a crime on indictment. Now, what that means, a technical term, it means that the crime has to be one that would be tried in the highest court in the land. So some sort of fraud on a form wouldn't necessarily ever go to that level. So the crime that they're going to prosecute, which I don't think the families have announced yet what crime they think uh, Mr Clark has committed, hasn't been announced. The, the ones on fraud wouldn't be necessarily appropriate for a private prosecution. Now, Penny Taylor, Sheriff Beckett criticised two doctors for not mm. passing on information about Harry Clark's medical history. What is a doctor's responsibility in this situation? Well, as a general practitioner, for instance, if you've got concerns about a patient's fitness to drive, uh, the guidance is that you would advise them, the patient, to inform the DVLA. You're then if you find out that they haven't done that, you're meant to ask them again to do it. And if they don't do that and you believe that they are putting other people at risk, then uh, you can um, break the, the confidentiality agreement that you have with that patient and tell the DVLA. But I suppose the question is raised, how many GPs for instance, um, you know, see the same patient on any kind of a regular basis. Um, uh, I can understand why GPs would think that that was a difficult process to follow. So do you think there would be resistance amongst doctors to the idea of it becoming a legal responsibility for them? Well, the General Medical Council, which is the regulatory body for GPs, has guidance that doctors, um, you know, are meant to follow. Um, the only way to change this would be to um, make it legislation, to make it mandatory that if a GP had a concern that they would have to tell the, the DVLA. Um, the, the principle of confidentiality is really important, a really important principle underlying the, the relationship of trust between a doctor and a patient. Um, doctors would fear, for instance, that if uh, a patient felt that they might get snitched on, for be you know, want of a, a better phrase, that they might not go to a GP yeah, to deal with a problem, say, if they were a professional driver, 
or um, that they just wouldn't trust, they, they wouldn't disclose everything that needed to be disclosed. So it, it's a fine balance that doctors at the moment have to weigh. There are very few instances where GPs are required to break that code. Uh, in England and Wales, for instance, if they suspect that um, female genital mutilation is about to take place or has taken place, they're under a duty to report it. If they suspect there's a ter um, you know, somebody who's being groomed for terrorism, for instance, or, or becoming a terrorist, they have to tell. And if there are certain communicable diseases, they have to tell. But those are the, the very, very few categories where they're required to break that confidentiality. OK, well, there we must leave it this evening. Penny Taylor, Nick McCarroll, thanks so much for coming in this evening. Thank you. It's the start of the second week of negotiations at the UN Global Climate Change Summit in Paris. And the First Minister is there. Nicola Sturgeon says she's cautiously optimistic a bold and ambitious deal will be agreed. David Miller, our environment correspondent, is live.